Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Leonard, and uh, the organizer of the meeting for inviting me. I think Dr. Maddox is a hard act to follow because she already argued some of uh, uh, my points. Thank you, Emilio Fabro. So I will attempt to argue the no side of this. So why not? Um, I will mention some of the things which I will not describe because I think some of the points are more obvious. One, some younger patients have comorbidities that will preclude them from going on to transplant. Uh, some patients have problems with insurance coverage. Some, problems will, uh, some patients will have uh, uh, issues in terms of ability to be off work or have uh, relatives help cover in their families. Um, transplants also have long-term toxicity as well. Uh, granted, it's autologous, so some of the toxicity uh, is mostly toxicity of uh, heavy-duty chemotherapy. And finally, just like Dr. Maddox pointed out, uh, there hasn't been actually a trial uh, showing overall survival advantage in the randomized fashion to autologous stem cell transplant consolidation. The data so far, progression-free survival uh, improvement. So the gold standard at least hasn't been met in that sense. Albeit, you know, the uh, trial Dr. Maddox mentioned, which was the European Mantle Cell uh, Network study, which was, uh, you know, post-CHOP with some rituximab and randomization to autologous stem cell versus interferon, there was a report in um, uh, abstract setting where there was some suggestion of improvement of overall survival on intention to treat basis, but that was never published. So it still stands as progression-free survival improvement. So putting those aside, what are other things that we need to consider? One, blastoid and TP53 uh, altered mantle cell lymphomas. So this is uh, one of the issues Dr. Maddox addressed. Two, indolent variants uh, with particular attention to non-nodal, leukemic non-nodal mantle cell lymphoma. Three, patients already in CR after an intensive regimen uh, with hyper CVAD, which again, Dr. Maddox has covered and question about whether people who are in MRD uh, negative remission need a transplant. And then a little bit of um, big picture view of autologous stem cell transplant as an approach in general. So this is not actually the official classification by any means. Uh, the WHO classification basically uses classical mantle cell lymphoma and a leukemic non-nodal variant as two uh, phenotypes. Uh, this is kind of I would say my clinical approach in view of mantle cell lymphoma. So we have blastoid mantle cell lymphoma, which is approximately 10% of the total. And they're variable numbers. Some people will go to 15. Uh, they have poor outcomes. Their survivals are uh, one to two years, and generally our therapy has not changed that. Uh, the typical mantle cell lymphoma, which is about probably 70%, I think their survival, if you break them out, is actually not as bad. It's probably around five to eight years. And finally, the indolent variants, which represent up to 20%, uh, whose survival is actually pretty good, uh, not great, uh, and where the transplant perhaps may not be necessary. So let's speak a little bit about uh, blastoid, which somewhat overlaps, but definitely not synonymous with TP53 alteration. So blastoid is a morphologic description. As such, as it's, it's subject to vagaries of interpretation. I've seen a lot of overcalls of blastoid morphology. In general, it refers to intermediate sized cells with large nucleus, scan cytoplasm, dispersed chromatin, kind of aggressive looking, blast looking cells. Uh, they typically have higher KI67, they have higher risk MIPI, and they do have a higher risk of TP53 alteration, although it's, it's kind of hard to pin down exactly what proportion it is. So as I mentioned, TP alterations are not synonymous, and then some uh, data sets actually hold out better than blastoid morphology in terms of predicting uh, unfavorable outcomes. The problem is in terms of TP53 alterations, they're measured differently, and different groups suggest different things. Um, so you know, they do have poor outcomes, both subsets, uh, regardless of treatment uh, modalities. So for TP53 altered mantle cell lymphoma, in the European MCL uh, network data showed overall survival 1.8 uh, years. They looked at TP53 deletion. Uh, combined Nordic MCL2 and an MCL3 data, and uh, Dr. Maddox showed MCL2, the difference with the MCL3 
they added ipratumab of tioxetan in uh, the conditioning regimen, and at the end of the, di the day, didn't find it to be terribly different from using rituximab as in vivo purge. So they combined the data sets. But there they measured TP53 mutations. Uh, there is also a European MCL network analysis that looked at overexpression by immunohistochemistry for TP53 and also found to be unfavorable. So I think TP53 is a work that's still in progress and kind of needs to be made more uniform to be uh, used in clinic more consistently. Also, complex cytogenetics is also known to be unfavorable. Uh, there was a publication uh, last year in Cancer showing that, but the overall survival was not nearly as uh, low um, as a TP53 altered one that was about five years. What about the indolent set? And again, within that, there are subsets. So there are two groups, one from Cornell and one uh, from British uh, Columbia Cancer Agency, that retrospectively described patients who were monitored for at least uh, three months with superior overall survival. So uh, the Cornell publication by Dr. Martin had 97 patients, out of which about a third were followed uh, without initial treatment for over three months, and 14, I believe, even over a year. Uh, that group had a, actually better overall survival than uh, the groups that uh, got treated. So that only means, of course, that we can potentially pick out that group, not that necessarily it doesn't benefit from a, a stem cell transplant, but it is possible to pick that group out. So in Cornell series, that uh, group uh, had a better performance status and lower risk IPI. Uh, in BCCA set, which was uh, 440 patients, 17% were monitored for at least three months. And things that correlated with them and their better overall survival were good performance status again, but also lack of B symptoms, normal LDH, non-bulky disease, non-blastoid morphology, and low KI-67. And here I want to also mention limited stage disease. Um, I mean, mantle cell lymphoma, it is pretty rare, actually, and this is exactly the setting where, let's say, you have only one area involvement uh, on a PET scan where I definitely do a bone marrow biopsy, and I actually ask for endoscopy as well, since we know in a, a series from MD Anderson where everyone got upper and lower endoscopy, there was 80% chance of finding mantle cell lymphoma in the GI tract on random biopsy. So these are the people, in my opinion, who would have been staged completely and truly have limited stage disease. So it's not a large proportion. However, in that setting, it is possible to use limited stage DLBCL approach where you use um, a short course of uh, chemoimmunotherapy followed by radiation therapy. So there are two small uh, retrospective series in that regard, one from British Columbia and one from Princess Margaret where they showed very reasonable five-year overall survival with uh, radiation plus minus a child-based regimen. Those series were heterogeneous. A lot of them actually did not use rituximab, so this is pre-rituximab, pre brutinib pre, pre, pre uh, a lot of the uh, uh, current settings. Um, there's also Swedish and Danish registry where they had a small percentage of patients uh, where they basically gave radiation primarily, and they also had very good outcome. What about indolent leukemic non-nodal mantle cell lymphoma? I don't know if you've seen them in clinic, but you know, uh, when I started uh, my career as a lymphomaniac, I saw these patients, and they clearly were different. I call them kind of having splenic marginal zone-like presentation. People call it by different names, but it basically means they primarily present in blood, bone marrow, and spleen, which is very different from a typical mantle cell lymphoma. Now, we also don't really have a good way of um, standardizing what it means that they have uh, minimal nodal involvement. Uh, in my experience, it usually means that they have maybe a couple of perisplenic lymph nodes up to 1.5 centimeters or less. That's about it. Um, so this subgroup is often known to have a, a small cell morphologic variant. They often have an um, IGH uh, 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 VH hypermutation. They often have non-complex cytogenetics, and they're typically SOX11 negative, with a SOX11 being a, a transcription factor that stains, you know, your classic uh, mantle cell lymphoma, even if it's uh, cyclin D1 negative. There are a few cases like that. 
Uh, so there was an LLMPP nanostring based 16 gene signature um, developed that differentiated classic from leukemic non-nodal variant for those classic mantle cell lymphomas that do have a leukemic uh, presentation. And it basically found uh, that uh, copy number alteration, basically, you know, cytogenetic complexity, and uh, predicted for worse outcomes in both groups. Uh, TP53 alterations were also unfavorable, but that didn't reach uh, statistical significance uh, in the uh, non-leukemic, uh, sorry, in leukemic non-nodals. Uh, so these patients do have favorable outcomes. They do represent a significant part of uh, the indolent uh, cohorts in both Cornell and BCCA series. What about patients that did receive uh, hyper-CVAD and uh, went to the CR. Again, Dr. Maddox covered that. Uh, this was a famous MD Anderson trial of 97 patients uh, with alternation of our hyper-CVAD with uh, RMA, meaning uh, rituxan hydose methotrexate cytarabine. In patients younger than 65, um, the outcomes were great, as you can see here. However, there were problems reproducing uh, this data in uh, settings outside of MD Anderson. So SWOG SO213 tried to replicate it. Uh, there were 39 patients who were unable to complete all cycles. Uh, the median PFS in patients under the age of 65, most of them were, uh, was 5.5 years, but median overall survival is not nearly as good as an MD Anderson series. Uh, to be honest, actually a three year uh, Mark, uh, the uh, MD Anderson and Swax here said virtually the same outcome. So the, the problems came later. They both had 73% uh, FFS in the case of uh, MD Anderson and PFS in the case of SWOG. There was also an Italian study that also tried to produce um, uh, the hyper CVAT experience, and that one in some way was even worse. There were, I believe, 61% of patients that couldn't complete all therapy. Um, the Nordic MCL outcomes are actually comparable to hyper CVAD with median PFS of 8.5 years and median overall survival 12.7. Dr. Maddox showed you those curves. There was an NCCN uh, database analysis, uh, which basically um, retrospectively showed that hyper CVAD and RCHOP followed by autotransplant had similar progression free survival and overall survival, while adding autotransplant to hyper CVAD did not seem to improve outcomes. So the conclusion from that is, yes, hyper CVAD is more toxic, and it's really MD Anderson that does it best. MRD assessment. Again, there's no uh, standard way to assess minimal residual disease right now. There are different ways. There's nested PCR, ASO PCR, uh, NGS-based uh, attempts. Uh, MRD is predictive of uh, PFS and overall survival across multiple studies, European MCL, Nordic, MCL 2 and 3, um, uh, both showed that. Uh, the uh, Nordic MCL 2 also used rituximab for uh, MRD only relapse post order transplant and was able actually to push uh, uh, several of those patients back into MRD negative remission. So the question is, do MRD-negative younger patients require an uh, autologous stem cell transplant? And Dr. Maddox uh, showed you uh, the uh, ECOG Akron EA4151. Uh, that, that is the ongoing study uh, to test you know, the need for autologous stem cell transplant in patients who are an MRD-negative CR1. So this is uh, kind of a more experiential existential question. Uh, as we see the kind of landscape of transplant studies, they generally use the same old conditioning regimens for several lymphoid malignancies without regard or really knowledge of comparative efficacy of specific conditioning regimens for specific lymphoma subtypes. Why? Conditioning regimens were developed uh, when myelosuppression suppression limited the efficacy of drugs available at the time. So more was better. For example, the most common regimen, which is BEAM, was developed in 1988. Um, just to give you an idea, the mantle cell lymphoma was defined as a separate lymphoma subtype in 1992. So this precedes it. 
Out of being the two drugs you would say are probably the most useful for mantle cell lymphoma would be cytarabine primarily, and to some degree, toposide. So that was okay when all we had were chemotherapeutic drugs, but what about now? There have been attempts to incorporate novel agents in the conditioning regimens in in vivo purging, notably rituximab and the Nordic MCL, and the brutumum of texatin in uh, uh, MCL3. Um, in the triangle study, you can argue maybe brutuma, uh, ibrutinib may be a little bit of uh, in vivo purge, however, it isn't really close in timing to uh, uh, the actual conditioning regimen. So despite all attempts, there has not been a randomized study of conditioning regimen for specific lymphoma subtype like mantle cell. There was luckily one for diffuse large B cell lymphoma where it was R beam versus Z beam. So beam, BAC, CBV, they all dominate. So the question I ask you, why do you expect new results from all drugs? And is myelibration still truly necessary? So what's the future of mantle cell lymphoma treatment? I think it, it belongs to rational combinations of targeted agents with monoclonal antibodies and potentially some classic chemotherapeutic agents like cetarabine that have shown some value. For example, Dr. Maddox also mentioned the rituximab lenalidomide trial, which is essentially a chemo-free regimen uh, presented by Cornell Group with uh, excellent outcome. Uh, it also included uh, rituximab lenalidomide maintenance. We have cellular therapies. So there is a Zuma 2 being tried for, uh, CAR -T, uh, which is a CAR T cell, uh, tried in relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma. Um, we have to incorporate uh, MRD assessment in out of routine practice. Um, at this point, MRD is not standard, but hopefully with a demonstration of uh, its importance in uh, making decisions, it will be. So how will autotransplant fit into this paradigm? So in conclusion, I think for younger patients with typical mantle cell lymphoma, uh, treated with non hyper cvad regimen, autologous stem cell consolidation is still the treatment of choice. For those with limited stage disease, indolent disease, blastoid or TP53 altered variant, or those who are in CR after hyper cvad the utility of auto stem cell transplant consolidation is questionable. And I think further developments are likely to marginalize myeloblation in favor of disease-specific approaches. Again, I thank you very much for this opportunity.